<laughs> well, that's possible. The software is always possible, but less likely. Okay. Okay. Any questions for me? Your exam, mid first midterm exam is exactly two weeks from today. Beginning class. Uh, class is fine, right? First one is a slide that's okay. And uh, hopefully, I guess I'm already hearing that it's easier in that lab. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> right? So once you get that comfort level, maybe the next one we can have it uh, um, using a living matlab. The only difference would be conceptually I want to test whether you understand the basic things that we are talking about. But once you have access to MATLAB, you'll be able to do more realistic problems. If you bring it by hand, we are limited to simpler ones. <laughs> right. So, uh, but yeah, there will be more of them, I guess, whereas we can go in depth on a single problem in a MATLAB session. So, we will look at, uh, after we do the first midterm exam, I think you'll get an idea of how many exams go. You have to get used to that too. And then you'll probably feel it. Okay. So there are uh, no questions. I um, don't know. Is there, should we wait for some more time? Are people coming in? This is what I <laughs> was afraid of when I started recording the lecture. Sometimes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, that explains. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So today I'm going to start putting all the tools that we have been talking about so far together to start assembling what are called transfer functions and building blocks to. Uh, uh, design a control loop. Very soon we will uh, uh, migrate towards that. In the last lecture we looked at the equivalence between a higher order system and an equivalent first order system. You should be able to convert that because that's what MATLAB handles and uh, even in the state space models typically we represent them as a system of first order equations. But it may be natural when you're developing the model from first principles particularly if you're doing uh, Newton's law of motion s equals n a. a is the acceleration, which is d squared x dt squared. So naturally, there's a second derivative there. Okay. So you might come across uh, equations with uh, higher order terms, and you should be able to convert that. Something that I will test in your uh, midterm exam. So you should be able to do my exam. I guess I should probably start preparing you for that. About 50% of it will be kind of straightforward from the lectures. Okay. And then I'll start pushing you into things that I haven't directly talked about that you should be able to apply. Okay. An example here would be if I give you a third order system and say write it into a three first order system, you have talked about it. You should be able to do that. Okay. I expect that. But if I give you two second order systems and say convert them into a first order system of equations, we have not directly talked about it. But it's a very simple extension of the idea. So if you understand the idea of how to transfer the higher order system into a first order system, you should be able to do that. Okay. So kind of pushing one step beyond what we have not directly worked through, but I would mention it. And throughout the lecture, you will see I mentioned a lot of these things. Okay. And uh, you should pay attention to it and uh, start, um, I guess, looking at it. So for this one, how would you go about it, for example? If I give you two second order systems. Right. So there will be two equations, two independent, uh, two dependent variables, one independent variable. So time is always an independent variable in all our cases. It's a dynamical system. So you might have two dependent variables. The first equation may be d squared x1 dt squared blah 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 something else. Second equation is d squared x2 dt squared plus the lower order terms there. So what you would do is you would say x1 equals y, dx1 dt equals y2, or x1 equals y1, dx1 dt equals y2. Then go to the next equation, say y3 is going to be x2 from the next variable. 
and y4 is going to be the x2 d to the second derivative. You'll end up with four first order equations. Okay? So that kind of ability you should have to be able to extend what we have basically covered in the class to slightly uh, different things. And then we talked about eigenvalues, so what they are and what are eigenvectors, and basically it is any problem like this where you have a vector multiplying the matrix gives you the same vector and you can systematically solve for these eigenvalues and eigenvectors given the matrix A. You should be able to do it for a two-way system by hand, quadratic equation is the most, and you should be able to do it for any number of uh, equations using MATLAB, using the EAG routine. You should know what EAG routine expects as an input, what it produces an output, and how to interpret that, how to use that result. Okay? And most importantly, we saw that the qualitative behavior of the solution in the eigenvalue space where we are plotting the real part of the eigenvalue and the imaginary part of the eigenvalue. Okay. So depending on where the eigenvalues are located, the transient response could be decaying or growing up monotonic or sinusoidal, things like that. So you should uh, understand uh, that qualitative behavior. Okay. So And then we saw the final value theorem in Laplace transform, which is useful for finding the steady state uh, without actually going into the inverse Laplace transform. And the procedure is very simple. If you're given a transform in solution in the transform space, Laplace space multiplied by S, put S equal to zero. That gives you the solution for T equal to infinity, or be the solution in the time domain window. Now, I'm going to start building. Uh, this is again nothing new in here, but we're putting a lot of this together. Okay? We've already seen how to write first principle space models, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, etc. And we're going to talk about something called linearization and introduce uh, a deviation variable. So typically chemical process plants operate under steady state conditions. Okay, we have steady input of uh, feed into the plant, uh, crude for example in a refinery, and they have steady outflow. From time to time you would make changes because the crude may be coming from Texas or they are on maybe from uh, Middle East, so the quality of the crude may be different. So you, those are disturbances. So the control action should be to reject these disturbances so that the output is the same, no matter what the input is, where the input is coming from. Um, the other one may be a set point change, because the output you want to deliberately change because the market conditions have changed. In summer, you have more gasoline demand. In winter, you have more demand for heating oil, for example. Okay? So you want to run your refinery in a different way. So you want to change the set point. Okay? And so we need to design a control system for both the cases. One is a set point change. The other one is a disturbance rejection, where it has to return to the set point. Okay? And uh, the principles are basically build a model for the entire plant and build a control system and look at the dynamics and make sure that the control system is tuned optimally. So I'm going to give you three examples in this lecture. The first one is a thermometer. Okay? So this is a cross-section of a thermometer. It's a mercury thermometer. You should be able to do the same thing for a thermocouple. Okay? So this one, for example, is uh, something like this. You have the mercury in here. And as you dip this in a hot fluid, for example, uh, the mercury is going to rise here giving you a particular reading. Now, it doesn't do it instantly. It takes certain time. So there is a dynamics associated with it. And it is this dynamics that we are going to try to capture in the model that we are doing. Okay? So what you're seeing here is a cross-section of the thermometer. Okay? I've taken a cross-section like this, and I'm viewing it from the bottom or the top. So here you see inside, this part is the mercury, the red part. And then the hashed uh, dark brown part is the glass wall. And then outside of it, you have a fluid contacting the uh, mercury thermometer wall. And so from heat transfer, you know that there is a kind of a film resistance. Okay? So the question is, when I did this in hot water, how fast is energy coming in? How fast is energy leaving? Is it leaving at all? And what is the rate at which energy is accumulated? And it is a rate of accumulation of energy that is going to determine how much the mercury is going to expand due to its coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay? And that's what pushes the mercury out, and you get a reading corresponding to the actual temperature. Okay? So that's the physical description. So now we're saying, OK, I'm going to 
take my control volume as the entire mercury, and I'm going to write an energy balance, input rate minus output rate equals rate of accumulation. Okay? Uh, the input rate is the heat is coming from the surrounding into the mercury. Okay, my control volume is all the volume surrounding the mercury. So that is modeled by a heat transfer coefficient. This comes from a heat transfer course. So these will be given to you in a problem. Okay? Uh, in an exam, I'll give you what is the heat transfer rate. So you don't have to remember that heat transfer rate is given by H times A times temperature difference, but you should know what these symbols are. Okay? So H is the heat transfer coefficient, A is the area for heat transfer. So that will be the surface area, for example, of this mercury bulb times the temperature difference between the surrounding temperature, X, and the temperature inside that uh, mercury Y. Okay? So Y is the temperature of the mercury. The units are given as well for each one of those variables. Okay? So that is the rate at which energy is coming. So it should be in the units of what? Rate of energy transfer, joules per second. Okay? So if you figure this out, for example, the transfer coefficient is joules per second per meter square C. Multiplied by A, it's sort of a meter square, multiplied by the temperature difference, that gives you joules per second. There is no energy leaving the control volume. Is that strictly true? Where, where, where is it leaving? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. But this expression is the net rate of energy transfer into that. Okay, so if you're saying that there is some sort of a locally thermodynamic equilibrium, molecules are bumping both ways but conducting heat both ways. But this is the net rate of heat transfer into that. Okay, so this model takes into account that kind of a heat exchange. But from the control volume, I want to know whether there is any other place where energy is leaving. And what you're finding out there is where it is not contacting. Suppose I immerse it this far, okay? Then my control volume I'm saying only is this much, okay? There's only one place where energy could be leaving, that is actually the mercury that is leaving that. It is carrying energy with it, okay? But it is so small compared to the mercury in the bulb. The, wall, the material, the mass of the mercury in the bulb is much larger compared to the mercury that goes into this capillary. The capillary is extremely thin. Okay? So we are going to neglect any heat loss on that. Otherwise, you need to know what is the rate of rise of the mercury so that you know what is the rate at which it is leaving. Okay? So we are going to approximate that as equal to zero. So there is some loss, but it's a very small loss uh, due to the material itself, mercury itself leaving the control volume. On the right side, we have rate of accumulation of energy within the control volume. That's a very key parameter. That's what causes the mercury to expand. So that's going to be mass times the specific heat of mercury times dy dt, the rate of change of temperature in the mercury itself. Okay, that's what causes the expansion. Okay, so that is the model. And here are all the uh, units. You can very easily check that it is dimensionally consistent, etc. At steady state, what we are going to say is that dy dt is zero. That is, once you have put the thermometer into a liquid, and then you're watching the level at a certain height, it doesn't change because it reaches a steady state. Okay? At that steady state, we have dy dt equal to zero. That means h times a times. I'm putting a subscript s to indicate that it's a steady state. x s minus y s equal to zero. This is nothing but the same equation that we had before. Okay. So now that I can show both of you, both of them at the same time, let me try to shrink it. Can you read so? So the equation that you see on the top is the dynamic equation, including the energy accumulation. The equation that you see at the bottom is the steady state part, where you said dy dt equal to zero. And to indicate that it is a steady state part, I'm putting the subscript s, saying that it is a steady state temperature, x s minus y s. This is a common practice that we will do in all steady state uh, uh, control. Because what we want to do is we want to subtract out the steady state from the dynamic and introduce something called the deviation variable. That is, what we are interested in is how far from the steady state a certain temperature is departing, how far from the steady state a certain concentration is changing. What we want is we want to ripple that change back to zero. Most of the disturbance reduction problem, we want this deviation from the steady state to be equal to zero. Okay? So you will find that it is a very common practice 
in uh, process control theory to uh, formulate, reformulate the problem using the steady state as the reference. Okay. Now, if that con concept is not clear, please ask me. I can try to explain it in different ways. Okay. So, we take the same equation and write it for steady state and then subtract one from the other. When you do that, what you're going to get is H A times X minus X S minus y minus y s on the left hand side. On the right hand side you will have m c, these are all constant, m is constant, c is constant, dy dt. Okay? So on the left hand side, subtracting 5.1 from minus 5.2, here we have h times a times x minus x s minus y minus y s. Okay? On the right hand side, uh, this is uh, the term that is zero. So on the right hand side you have m c times d dt of y, but I've written it as minus y s. Can I do that? It says we can do that because y s is a constant. Steady state temperature is a constant. Y is a function of time, and x could be a function of time, but x s and y s are at steady state. Okay? So those are constants. So by taking the derivative of a constant, it's zero. Why would I want to introduce that? So that I can define y minus y s as my capital Y, which is my deviation variable. Okay. And similarly, x minus x s is my capital X. Capital X is the deviation variable from the steady state. When I do that, I uh, and then I'm defining uh, tau as equal to m c divided by h a. Okay. So that is, I'm taking h a to the other side, and I'm calling that as my time constant, which we have already seen before. Okay. So my equation becomes capital X minus capital Y equals tau times dy dt. This is a dynamical equation, but the variables that I'm dealing with are deviation variables. Deviation from steady state. Okay. Capital X and capital Y are deviation from the steady state. And you can then combine the Y terms on the left hand side and the X term on the right hand side. Is this a linear or a nonlinear equation? What is the unknown that we are solving for? Why? Why is the temperature in the mercury? Okay. Why is the dependent variable? And X is the surrounding temperature. That's the forcing variable. What do, why do I mean by forcing? I can have two beakers, one at 60 degrees, the other one at 80 degrees. I'm forcing the temperature on the thermometer. Okay. So if I put it in the 60 degrees, the thermometer should rise to 60 degrees. Force it in 80 degrees, it should rise to 80 degrees. Right? So x is the forcing function. Typically, forcing function is a term that appears on the right hand side of a differential equation. That is an input. You choose, you decide, you drive the process. This is where the control action will also be implemented. We have already seen that in one of the examples earlier. Okay? So, and y is the output. So we call x as the input, y as the output, tau as the time constant. And it is a linear equation because tau is a known number. It is given in terms of m c h a. These are all numbers that are given in terms of coefficient, surface area of the uh, thermometer bulb, and mass of the mercury, and the surface heat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The surrounding temperature itself can change, and uh, how can it change? It can change, for example, if I have 80 degree water and then I pour some cold water. Okay, so I'm forcing the surrounding temperature to change as a function of time. X could be changing as a function of time, but X S would be the steady state when that reaches the steady state. Whatever the new temperature is, when that reaches the steady state. So, that is really the only new thing that we have introduced this idea of a deviation variable from the steady state. Otherwise, building the model and uh, uh, writing down it as a differential equation is something that we have done many, many times before. And now we are going to use the Laplace transform and take the Laplace transform of this differential equation. Okay? So, you get Laplace transform of the derivative, which is x times the Laplace transform of that function. 
Okay. Uh, of course, tau remains as tau because tau is a constant. So tau times the Laplace transform of the derivative, which gives you s times the Laplace transform of the function, plus the Laplace transform of y, which is y s again, and on the right hand side, Laplace transform of x, which is equal to x s again. Okay. So that now this is an algebraic equation. This is the main advantage of introducing the Laplace transform. It allows us to go from the differential equation, differential domain, to an algebraic domain. Now I can collect the terms of y of s, which is the unknown that I want to solve for, is uh, multiplied by 1 plus tau s equals xs, or I can write it as ys divided by xs equals 1 over 1 plus tau s, which is what we call the transfer function. So this is a new terminology that you might uh, you need to deal with from now on. Okay, it's called a transfer function. The transfer function basically transfers inputs to outputs. Okay? And this we will do for every unit in a complicated process flow sheet. For every unit, there is an input stream, there is an output stream, and we want to relate the input and the output stream to developing a model, linearizing it in some cases. In this case, the linear model. So we have introduced the idea of linear linearization, which you will see uh, in a few lectures and so. Okay. But and then uh, introducing the deviation variable and taking the transform, the plus transform. So the transfer function is a function in the Laplace domain that transfers the input to an output. Okay. So typically you will write this as y of s equal to g of s multiplied by x of s. Okay. This is what we will call as input and this is the output. And the transfer function transfers the input to outputs. And the transfer function can have many time constants. In this case, it is a first order transfer function because it comes from a first order differential equation. So it is basically a first degree polynomial in S with one time constant. If you start with a second, degree, a second order differential equation, you will have a second degree polynomial here. That will be two time constants. Okay? So that the relationship will be between an input and an output. Any questions on that? I have a question for you. I guess I just have an answer also there. Why is the initial condition not present here? When we did the transfer, uh, Laplace transform, okay, if you uh, take the Laplace transform of dy dt, Laplace transform of that, we said it is s times y of s minus y of 0. Right? That should always be there, but I forgot, or I deliberately left it out. Why did I do that? Because y of 0 is always 0 when you are dealing with deviation from a steady state. Okay? Because, because it is defined as a deviation variable, so when you are beginning the process, the process is at steady state, so its initial condition is 0, and then you perturb the system by adding something up, and you want to see whether it comes back to the steady state or not. Okay? So, that's in that sense also, the Laplace transform. Uh, coupled with the deviation variable makes the transformation quite natural and easy because all the initial derivatives, uh, initial conditions will automatically be zero as a departure from the steady state. Any questions? Okay. So this is how we represent them in a block diagram. So this is, in this case, the process captured by GS is the response of a thermometer. But it could be the response of a reactor a distillation column, a fluidized bed, whatever it is, from a control point of view, all we are saying is there is an output from the process, there is an input to the process, and the process dynamics gives you a transfer function. This transfer function, you should know how to derive it from first principles. Okay? Writing down the conservation law, linearizing it, introducing deviation variable, get this. That's going to be a major part of this course. You should be able to do this transfer function for each of the units and then put them together to form your control loop. Okay, right now all we are doing is what are the types of responses for this kind of a setting. When you have different types of inputs, uh, how is the output related by uh, a first order transfer function? The other thing that you should notice is this idea of a superposition. Okay? Superposition simply says for any linear system, this is a linear system, uh, if you have two different inputs, different inputs x1 and x2, 
the output is going to be the sum of these inputs. If you add the two inputs, okay, this is like saying I have x1 and I have x2. Two inputs are taking the system to depart from the steady state. Okay? So the output is going to be sum of this x1 and x2. And that's what we are representing here mathematically. Why is this? Because this is the consequence of two things. One is the model, the transfer function is linear. The other one is Laplace transform is a linear operator. We saw that earlier when we looked at the properties of Laplace transform. Okay? We have a Laplace transform of sum of two functions. It is the same as the Laplace transform of the, the sum of the Laplace transform. Okay? So because of that, you can do uh, take y1 by itself, y2 by itself, and y1 would be given by g times x1, and y2 will be given by g times x2. Okay? And if you have x as sum of x1 plus x2, weight is sum, where a1, a2 can be any constant, weight is sum, then the output will be the sum of the weighted transforms individually. So you can do this individually, y1 and y2, and then multiply by a1, multiply by a1, y1 plus a2 times y2 will be your net output as a consequence of linearity. And these are very important because later on what we will do is we will have a complex excitement of the process. Okay? You are changing the speed uh, in a very particular way, ramping it up uh, over a period of time, for example. That can be broken down into a series of step changes, for example. Okay? Then you can look at what is the response to a step change. MATLAB has built-in functions for doing that. So you can construct responses for more complicated uh, inputs by treating it as some of the responses for simpler inputs, like a step change. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, inputs are specified functions or numbers or constants. So uh, they don't you won't call them nonlinear in the sense you can have an input, okay, uh, that increases linearly and becomes constant. Or you can have an input, and we'll see a few sets of inputs, like this, a step change. Or you can have an input that does this, sinusoidally changing. Okay? All these will be just considered as linear inputs. Because when you're talking about nonlinearity, we are talking about the output. Okay? So we have to look at the y in the equation and ask, are there nonlinearities in that y? Do I have y squared? Do I have sine of y? That will make it nonlinear. But if I have sine of x on the right hand side, that doesn't make it nonlinear. It's still linear. Okay? So no matter how complicated the exciting uh, excitement is on the right hand side, whether it's a sine function or exponential function, it is still uh, a linear problem. Okay? Uh, this kind of a problem, in fact, will be called, this is the terminology that MATLAB uses, and control literature they use. LTI, which stands for linear time invariant system. Meaning none of the coefficients in the problem depend on time. Except the forcing. The forcing can depend on time, but not like tau that appears here is a constant. If there is any other constant that appears here is a constant. So it's a linear time invariant. It doesn't change with time. Linear time invariant system. Okay? So there are a lot of built in modules in MATLAB for LTA system. We'll go to MATLAB pretty soon to see some of these examples. So I'm kind of digging in MATLAB as and when needed so that you know what the tools are available that are uh, allows you to implement these ideas. Okay? So some of the commonly used excitations or inputs are a step input, an impulse input, a sinusoidal input. And any other arbitrary input can be considered as a combination of these three inputs. So these are the most commonly examined from the point of view of control action. Okay? Because anything else we can construct as a superposition, because the system is linear time invariant. Right? So you can use the superposition principle to handle any arbitrary input if you can understand how the system responds to a step input, an impulse input, and a sinusoidal input. Now, what are these? I think we've already seen the step input before. So we're talking about x, the right hand side, the input. Okay? So the step input is given by a times u of t. Graphically, it simply means a is the amplitude of the step, 
can be typically unit factor change goes by one, or you can make it go by any number, but it goes in an instantaneous fashion. Okay, from zero in at time equal to zero, it goes to a. So u of t is called a unit step in, uh, step, response, step function. Unit step function. In MATLAB, they call it heavy side function. The name for it is heavy side function. Okay, and the mathematical definition of it is x is equal to zero for t less than zero and x is equal to a finite amplitude A for t greater than or equal to zero, and the transform of that function is 1 over x, which we have seen when we did the Laplace transform. When you apply the Laplace transform to that function, you get 1 over x. So here it is A over f because the type of magnitude can be A. That's very easy to understand, okay? Um, and that would be useful, particularly for this case where we are taking the thermometer and dipping suddenly into a different liquid. And uh, we want to see how the response is. Now, the impulse response is a bit more difficult to understand. Uh, do you have some conceptual understanding of what an impulse response, what an impulse uh, uh, exciting excitement is? What, what, what does impulse mean? It's, it, it's a car crash is an impulse, right? So that's probably the closest one that you can kind of relate to. It's as if you are putting a finite known amount of energy in a finite time, but that time is made to appear approach zero. Okay. Uh, one example that I could give you is if I have, for example, a tank from which water is draining, okay, and the height is constant, and so I have something coming in and some water leaving. So everything is under steady state. All of a sudden, I come and take a bucket of water and pour it. Okay. So that's if I'm doing it instantaneously. Then what happens? That sets up a disturbance. The level immediately goes up. That means it's going to start draining faster. So if you want to find out how does the height change with time, that would be the closest to an impulse response. So an impulse response in reality is always like this. At time t equal to zero, you increase it to a certain value. And immediately, after a short time, you bring it back. So you can actually think of an impulse response as a superposition of two step responses. What would that be? What two step responses should you add to get this kind of an impulse response that goes up and down? Exactly. What you need to do is you need to have this, which will increase it, but the step response keeps it at the constant value forever. If you put another step response, which says, after a short time, I'm going to take it to negative A, okay, minus A, and keep it at minus A. So minus A cancels the effect of plus A, and it basically brings it back to zero. Okay? This, again, superposition allows you to do this. In MATLAB and in Simulink later on, you will see that you can construct these kinds of uh, forcing on the system by taking two step responses, slightly offsetting by a certain time, and imposing one uh, positive, the other one is negative. Okay, you can create something approximating an impulse response. But the true meaning of a mathematical meaning of an impulse response it is that this limit process, as b goes to zero, as b goes to zero, b is this gap. So we want the area under this curve to be finite. And that area should represent A. That is, in, uh, in a crash kind of a thing, that is the, that signifies the amount of energy. Okay? How much of energy are you going to dissipate in a finite amount of time? Okay? So in fact, when you're designing the car, you want to design in such a way that the front of the car absorbs as much energy as possible. So you should have an idea of how much of energy it is containing, and when it impacts in a short time, how much of energy it should absorb. So that is equal to the area under this curve. So the area under this curve is going to be the y-axis, which is A over B, multiplied by the x-axis, B, which is the A. Okay? So in the, in the first case, A had a magni uh, magnitude of a step change. Here, A is a measure of the total amount of energy contained in that impulse as that impulse goes to zero. So if we want to be able to consider like this. Okay. The area should be the same, but we should make it large, longer and longer, and smaller and smaller, 
And then the limit of B going to zero passes an instant of time you get an infinite amount of uh, perturbation. But the energy is finite, the integral. So the integral of this one will always be finite. And that's what gives you A. Now the Laplace transform of such a function, A times delta D, is A. The amount of energy contained in that impulse. Okay. So I don't know whether you've seen this delta T. What is delta T? It's called the Dirac delta function. The meaning of the Dirac delta function is at t equals to zero, it's infinity. Everywhere else it's zero. Okay. Any questions? Well, yeah, the, the impulse is defined as the energy in it. So the impulse will be finite. That will be A, like A over B will go to infinity because you're dividing by B, which is zero. Okay? So the y axis will tend to go towards infinity. The x axis width will tend to go towards zero. But the product of that will always be finite because it is always A over B multiplied by B. So B cancels off, always giving you A. Okay? So the energy itself cannot be infinite. Right? So what you're saying is in an impulse, the energy contained has to be finite, but it is dissipated over shorter and shorter distance, so the force could be very large, approaching infinity. Okay? But uh, the total energy contained in that should be a finite amount. And the Laplace transform of such a function will be simply A. Let me ask you this question. If I have a function f of x, and I multiply this by delta x, and then do the integral from 0 to infinity, as a mathematical thing, dx, what do you think that will be? What am I trying to do, and what will be the answer? Geometrically, what I'm doing is the following. I have f of x, some function. The function is like this, for example. Okay. And the delta, I have to apply a certain instance. So actually, I should have this as uh, x minus a, for example, where a is this position. Okay. So that direct delta function says at a equals 0, the function is infinite. Everywhere else, the function is 0. Okay. So I am integrating that function multiplied by f of x over the entire limit 0 to infinity. The, the net effect of that is this is going to be the same as the function evaluated at a, whatever the function value is. Okay? Because it is a and an integral, but this product picks that function at that point. Okay? And that is why when you carry out, for example, this is something I would ask you to do it on your own. Take the Laplace transform of A times delta T. Okay? You know the definition of Laplace transform. Just straightforward application of Laplace transform definition and carrying out the integral using this rule. The delta function just picks the value of the function at that location. Okay? And integrate that. The integral will automatically give you this A. The Laplace transform of a direct delta function is simply the total energy contained uh, by that impulse. Now, the next kind of input is the sinusoidal input, where the forcing is changed in a periodic fashion. This is an extremely useful input, not very commonly found. You will not find any refinery that operates where the feed flow rate is changed in a sinusoidal fashion or a composition is changed in a sinusoidal fashion. But it's an extremely important input from control theory point of view. Can anybody guess why that might be the case? That's exactly what it is used for. Okay. So any arbitrary random noise in the system, you've seen Fourier series. So the precise connection is Fourier series. Any arbitrary function f of x that represents a noise, for example, can be written as a linear combination of of n omega n i omega x. 
plus v i times cosine of n i omega i x, for example. Any arbitrary function can be represented as a linear combination of sines and cosines. Okay. And that's what Fourier uh, series expansion allows us to do. So if I can examine the response for any particular frequency and scan the entire frequency spectrum, I can capture the effect of the response for any arbitrary response. So control system design, we'll see later on something called Nyquist uh, plot, where we are actually going from time domain to frequency domain, okay? where we are scanning the entire frequency because sine, cosine, or, or range of frequencies allows us to represent any arbitrary uh, disturbance, any arbitrary noise. Okay? So that is why the sine and cosine series at inputs are extremely powerful tools for probing the dynamical response of the system. Any musician here? Okay, let me ask you a question. <laughs> um, I'm not a musician, but um, synthesizers. How are synthesizers made? That gives you the connection between Fourier series <laughs> and something that's completely uh, physical, mathematical to the physical world. A synthesizer can produce any musical sound that you want, right? You can just set it to piano or violin or flute or whatever. But if you're hitting a note A, 440 hertz, they all produce the same fundamental frequency, 440 hertz. You can identify this is from the piano, this is from the violin, this is from the trombone, whatever. The same note. But you can t tell which instrument is producing that, even though the fundamental frequency is the same. Right? What allows you to do that? What's so called overtones. Okay, the fundamental frequency is the same, but the higher harmonics that are produced by each instrument is different. So if you just sample that sound and do a Fourier analysis on that, okay, suppose I have one sound coming from some instrument at a particular waveform. Okay, what Fourier series allows you to do is represent this arbitrary function f of x as a linear combination of Fine. So the fundamental frequency will be 440, plus the higher harmonics in the series because the summation is over all i. So I take the next higher harmonics, for example, twice the frequency, and then add it with a certain raising function, and then take the next one, for example. Okay. So take higher and higher frequencies and add them up to produce this basic pattern that particular instrument produces. So the difference between different instruments is in the magnitude of these higher harmonics. That's what allows you to identify this A is coming from this particular note. Okay? So the Fourier series is useful in control theory, it is useful in music, it is useful in many, many areas of solving differential equations, in fact. Okay? Uh, so when you saw it probably in mathematics, you didn't see that connected, but it's a very practical and uh, useful uh, tool. So that is why. These are all explanation of why I should study uh, responses to A to the power sine omega t. All right. So here I have x of t. Uh, this is the steady state. So I'm going to force a certain pattern. Okay. That means I'm going to force a certain amplitude and a certain frequency, the wavelength related to the frequency. Okay. So we're going to look at the output for each one of these responses for our system. Any questions? Response to various uh, inputs. Let's start with the step input. X of S is given by A divided by S. Okay. When you have a step input, the Laplace transform of the step input is 1 over S. So if the step magnitude is A, then the Laplace transform is A over S. Okay. That's something that is important because when you're implementing in MATLAB, you need to understand the magnitude of that amplitude. In the step response. So my original function was y is equal to g times x. Here I have made a choice for x. I'm saying x is a over s. And I already know g. g comes from the process description. In this case, it's a manometer. Okay? So g is 1 over tau s plus 1. Multiplied by x, which is a over s. All I need to do is I can forget about differential equations. Okay? I can just do, in the algebraic world, I do this multiplication, do partial fractions, or go directly into MATLAB, 
to get the inverse response. Okay? So YFS, in this particular case, if I have a set response, is going to be given by this product, which you can write as partial fractions, and then invert it. And this is your solution. The dynamic response of the mercury. Okay? And tau here is the time constant of the mercury. And the time constant of the mercury depends on what? Depends on? It's heat capacity, it's amount of the mercury that you have, the mass, things like that. Okay, the geometrical parameters. So if you plot it, um, typically you will plot it as y divided by a. So this is a unit step response, normalized, so that you can use this graph for any step response of any particular uh, magnitude. So the y-axis goes from 0 to 1, and y divided by a. So take this, move it to the left-hand side. So plot y over a. Against the independent variable is not simply tau t, but it is t over tau. This one is t divided by tau. Okay, so this graph is good for any first order system. If you have a system that is describable by a first order process, all you need to know is what is its time constant. Then you can come to this graph and answer a lot of questions about the dynamic response. What are the questions one can ask? Questions like, how long does it take for the thermometer to reach 98% of the steady state or 60% of the steady state? Okay. <coughs> or when the time is a particular value, what would it read? What would be the temperature? Those are the kind of questions you can answer by simply looking at the graph. And we'll see how to generate this graph in MATLAB shortly. Any questions on that? So all I've done is I've used the inverse Laplace to go from the Laplace domain to the time domain, and this happens to be 1 minus e to the power minus t over tau. That's the solution for any first order system that is subject to a step change. Subject to a step change. So the change actually is like this in the input. But the response is not immediate. The response is something like this. What would I like? I would like the response to be as close to the step input as possible. So what does it mean about the time constant? You want the time tau to be large or small? <coughs> now interpretation, right? You need to interpret from the results what value of tau should I have so that I get a curve that follows the step change as quickly as possible. That line you can use it as as small as possible. Right? And the time constant should be very small so that it responds very quickly. Okay? <coughs> that, as a designer, you get to design that. So you can say, my thermometer valve is going to be a certain volume that decides how much of mercury you put in. Right? And you can say, I don't want to use mercury, I want to use alcohol or something else. Okay, so this is where we talked about at the very beginning of this course. If you come into a situation where as a control engineer you're dealing with a system existing in operation, you don't have much control, okay, because all the design decisions have been made before. But the ideal thing would be to do a proper design, keeping control in mind when you are designing it. Okay, then we get the best control action, the best design in some sense. Okay. But tau is something that a design engineer would have to uh, worry about. Now, here is a simple example which simply says the thermometer having a time constant of 0.1 minutes. It's not that. You take it in within 0.1 minutes, it is approximately, not 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, will give you the steady state temperature, right? Is a steady state temperature of 90 degrees. So I want you to read this and see whether you can understand it so that you can answer the question. So we'll look at the solution right now. Okay. So the time constant is 0.1 minutes and is at a steady state temperature of 90 degrees. So it is immersed in a bag where the bag temperature is 90 degrees. Okay. As time t equal to zero, the thermometer is placed in a temperature bath. Just take it all of a sudden and put it into another bag that is at 100 degrees. It is maintained at 100 degrees. Okay. Determine the time needed for the thermometer to read 98 degrees. So it's obviously going to go from 90 degrees to 100 degrees. Okay, that's a step change. Okay, and the response is going to be something like this. And you want to know when it reaches 98 degrees, what is the time? 
how long does it take to reach 98 degrees? From that graph, for example, or from the analytical solution. Okay. So what you need to know, because the solution is precedent in terms of deviation variable, what is the steady state initially? It was 90 degrees. Okay. So what is in the solution that we have? Uh, y is equal to a times e to the power uh, one minus. Yeah, a times one minus. Minus that is the solution. You need to figure out from this description what is A and what is tau. Tau, of course, is given. Okay? Tau is 0.1. That's given to you. And what is the amplitude? 10 degrees. It goes from 90, uh, from 80 to or 90 to 100. Okay? So A should be 10 degrees. <coughs> And on the y-axis, you want it to go from 90 to 98 degrees. You want to know the time when it is 98 degrees. Okay. So in an exam, I'm going to just give you that graph and post questions like this. Okay. Uh, unless you do it in MATLAB, then you can do uh, a solution uh, in MATLAB. Okay. So what we're asking is, what is what is the time when the output is eight deviation variable? Okay. Is 98 meaning 98 minus 90? The steady state is 90. Our deviation variable uh, y is defined as y minus ys. In this case, y that we want is 98 degrees, and ys is 90 degrees. So the deviation variable that you have is 8 degrees. And the unknown is t, so you can solve for t. <coughs> okay. So let's uh, find up MATLAB and see how we were basically set up. So, so there are a few commands, I think, that uh, are extremely powerful, and we're going to see it only in its simplest form. And uh, <coughs> the commands are tf, which defines the transfer function, and step. OK? Oh, sorry, my other time? You have to stop me. Sometimes I just get carried away. OK, we will do this in MATLAB in the next class. <laughs>